Hi guys, we have a gloomy day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here in Newtown, Connecticut. I have found myself in, of all places, here on Thursday, September 6, 2018, 95 degrees in New England today. But uh, we are going to go all over the planet here today where I have the great honor of speaking to Mike Farragan and Jennifer Hines from Extinction Radio. And so we're going to be in Edinburgh, Scotland, talking to Mike in Boulder, Colorado, talking to Jennifer. And they're going to tell us all about what they do at Extinction Radio. So we're going to start with our old buddy, Mike. So, Mike, why don't you come on from Scotland, say hi to the gang, and uh, just give us a little background of what Extinction Radio is and what your your view of your world view is and we'll take it from there. Well, uh, thank you very much for having me on uh, the the new Collapse uh, Chronicles, uh, Sam. Um, it's much appreciated. Um, uh, I, I, my world view probably it, it encapsulates more than just Extinction Radio. Um, or, or what I do encapsulates more than just Extinction Radio uh, because I run the near-term human, uh, well, I don't run, I, that's, that's, very, um, that's very white male supremacist. Um, I'm part of a team, um, I'm part of a team uh, that runs by consensus um, of uh, the near-term human extinction support group on Facebook, um, and I'm an admin there. Um, so um, what me and Jennifer do, it, we'll just start with Extinction Radio. Um, we've been a bit um, lapsed recently in that we, we haven't done much, but um, we've only put one out in a couple of months or one out every month, and it used to be every two weeks. Um, our latest one is up now, and it's a, a good interview with Paul Beckwith. So that's extinctionradio.net. Uh, if anybody wants to go and uh, see that, I'm sure a lot of people have heard of Paul Beckwith. Um, uh, uh, but the Near Term Human Extinction Support Group is where I spend most of my time, and that's where we deal with um, we deal with people who who um, believe that um, in the near term, which is obviously open to um, interpretation, what the word near means, how soon is near, um, that we're going to go extinct as human beings along with just about all of the other species on this planet. So my worldview is uh, collapse pretty soon, and we'll maybe get into that uh, a bit later as to the soon and how near and stuff. Um, but basically, I've been a I've been an activist uh, for social environmental justice, a campaign facilitator um, all my life, and uh, I was full of hope up until about eight years ago. And uh, for those that don't know what hope is, it's unrealistic ideas that uh, we can actually not collapse and um, we are bound for collapse in fact we're already collapsing um, and uh, yeah so I left this opium and now I'm uh, a, a full, fully credited human. Okay those last few words one more time your, your Scottish accent got in the way there. <laughs> um, I'm a fully credited human. Oh, you got it. I said a zoomer. I'm a fully credited doomer. A fully accredited doomer. Okay, Mike, we're gonna come. We're gonna come back to you, but I want to go talk to this to this lovely lady who is uh, who I'm sure we all want to go uh, talk to. And we'll come back to you, Mike. So Jennifer Hines from Boulder, Colorado, would you come on here to Collapse Chronicles and say hello to the folks and tell us what is a nice girl like you doing in a rabbit hole like this? How did you get here? Oh my God, you find yourself in the damnedest places sometimes. It's you just did. not my fault, you know, I'm here. <laughs> How did you fall down? I mean, look at you. I mean, I can tell you, actually, I'm going to admit, I, I have been to this woman. I, I am her gardener, as a matter of fact. I am this woman's, or I, I was planting daffodils for the end times in her beautiful backyard. You, you have a beautiful home. You, you have a nice car. You, you have a good job with a corporation we won't talk about. Uh, but you're, you're living the, the life of the, 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 if I had to pick a person, the, the last person, just, just if I didn't know this dirty secret about you, 
Jennifer Hyde <laughs> just met you. It's not uh, too dirty, uh, believe me. <laughs> absolutely flabbergasted. How did you, how did a, a quote, normal person such as yourself uh, <clears throat> come down here into the, into the business there? Uh, you know, it just kind of happened. I mean, I am an intellectually curious person, but more than that, I guess at my base, like, I'm sort of a seeker. Like, I'm looking for truth, I'm looking for meaning, I'm looking for information, like a lot of us are, right? And um, I really came into understanding the direness of our situation probably about maybe around the same time as Mike and I told you that wouldn't happen um, and um, it, it really kind of precipitated um, I guess if you have to kind of crystallize a moment of awakening so yes as you can see I I live in opulent surroundings, but you know, collapse kind of happened around me, you know, and I woke up and what am I to do? I mean, I've lived here for 20 years. Am I to leave my house and just all of a sudden shut everything down just because I come to a realization? But I did come to this realization about, uh, well, when I flew over Greenland in August of uh, 2012, it was actually early September of 2012, I was coming back from the UK and I flew directly over Greenland when coming back to Boulder. And I was absolutely shocked. 2012, as you probably remember, was a year that Greenland on the surface melted 95% and the entire surface was full of, you know, rivers and, 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 and ponds and lakes and, you know, moulins and <clears throat> icebergs were just discharging all over the place. And I flew over this debacle. This is a commercial airline as a tourist. Yeah, as uh, like uh, British British Air was. For you to look out the window of your comfortable airplane uh, yeah. and yeah. say, whoa, the, the planet's falling apart literally below me. Right. And not only did I look out, you know, out my window, but I was the only one in the airplane that looked out my window. So you were like the guy in the twilight zone with a, with a little guy on the wing <laughs> tearing apart the rivets of global <laughs> industrial civilization. and yeah. And ending up in a, in a straight jacket for pointing this out to the rest of the people on the plane. Right. I did kind of feel like shouting and say, open the window. <laughs> Look, we're flying over Greenland. It's melting. It's melting. It's melting. <laughs> but um, I did something else with that knowledge and that awareness. And that's really kind of what propelled me to whatever. <clears throat> and probably why Mike and I are working together today. So I had this realization where my whole world was like, oh my God, Greenland is, is falling apart. I already knew that Greenland had something like 27 feet of sea level rise wrapped up in it, in its ice cap, you know, its little ice sheet it, itself. But I could see that it was, it was melting down and it was going to melt down as fast as it possibly could. And so with this awareness, I renewed my studies about the Arctic especially. And in 2014, I gave a presentation to a Tipping Points forum. Um, it was recorded, and it was about Arctic methane. It was called the Arctic Methane Monsters Rapid Rise. And it's still out there on YouTube. And excellent. Uh, it, yeah, it's, it's still great. out there. I, I made some rather rash predictions in there because I was following Peter Wadham's work, and he steered me all wrong that year. I love Peter Wadham so much. Um, but that he was saying that the Arctic was probably going to melt down between like 2015 and 2016. Obviously, it's still there. But the point is, is the Arctic is melting down and it's getting thinner and thinner and thinner. And when the Arctic sea ice goes, of course, well, you know, then then things are going to change even more quickly than they're changing now. Okay, I want to, uh, let, let's, I, I need to keep bouncing back and forth to you, so I'm going to be trying to keep all of this straight in my tongue. My, let's go back, let me go back over to, uh, to that man to the right of you. So, so Mike, right. Let, right. let's pick up uh, on, on what you were saying, and, and, and I want to get, I'm going to come back and ask you the same question in a minute, Jennifer. You mentioned five minutes ago, Mike, that we are collapsing 
now. I think that was a direct quote. Didn't you say we are we are we are collapsing now or something very similar a few minutes ago? Expand on that. Why, why do you think we are collapsing now? Well, <clears throat> it depends. It's, it's, I suppose it's semantics in a way, um, but if. You, Really, as soon as industrialization, uh, industrial civilization started um, in, what, let's call it from 1750, as soon as we started burning fossil fuels, although I think the Chinese were doing it before us uh, in, a, in a different way, but not much long before us, or indeed, I suppose you could go even further back as soon as we developed ag agriculture, and um, then uh, that was the start of the collapse. I know it's a strange way of looking at it, but if you want to bring it right up to date, you just have to look at Venezuela and what's happening in Venezuela and look at Africa and look at the hunger in Africa, look at the population potential, <coughs> population increase in Africa and the fact that people are starving. So it's collapsing all around the world. It's just us privileged Westerners that... Um, don't, don't um, uh, realize that it's collapsing because the food is, is still on the shelves. Until the shit hits the fan in our own faces, um, then we won't realize that this collapse has been under a way for a long time. I, I really think it began a long, long time ago, but I can't really put my finger on what the cause was of us uh, as, a, as a species um, being such an ignorant species that uh, has destroyed the planet. I don't know where that started, but what I'm trying to say is that wherever that was way back in history, that's when the collapse started in effect. Um, do, you, do, you follow, do you follow, Sam? Uh, 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 of course I do. Uh, right. But, but <laughs> yes, I've, I've been, uh, or, or, or various forms of me have been, been the focus of my life now and going on 10 years. But what I, what I really, if you're familiar with this, with this channel, Collapse Chronicles, you'll probably be uh, prepared for the next question I'm getting ready to ask you. And then I'm going to ask Jennifer the same question is 2050. You know, I always keep talking about 2100. Let's back it up to 2050. You're staring to your crystal ball, Mike Perrigan, and give us a, a, a picture of planet Earth in 2050. Well, I remember being asked this very same question when I was hopium filled and very involved with NGOs such as Greenpeace, the Green Party, Friends of the Earth, and the like. And my answer then was very different. But um, asking me that today, in 2050, I believe that uh, human beings will be extinct. We may have some very basic forms of life left on the planet, but most of the species on the planet will be gone and we will be extinct. There you go. And this is, I, I, I'm, I, I, don't want, I don't want to put words in your mouth. So why, what is going to be the main driver of, uh, of this, the ultimate collapse? Well, there are lots of drivers uh, that we know about. We, we know about, and, and they can all contribute together. They can all uh, hit off in different ways. Um, we've got habitat destruction, ocean, ocean acidification, resource depletion, um, but we've got nuclear war, nuclear meltdowns. Um, but the one that really clinches it for me is climate change. Um, we can do nothing uh, to um, stop our climate changing and stop the increases in temperature, temperatures which are gonna come over the next few years and the release of methane, which is gonna compound the issue. So, so the, 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 the methane bomb, I, I know you and I have both interviewed Peter Wadhams uh, <laughs> in the past few weeks, and it seems like he, he's, the, he's of the camp that the methane bomb, or the, the methane bomb as Europeans call it, is the is the biggest wild card uh, in the deck right now? Do you agree with that? Well, um, it is. I, mean, I actually think without the methane, we'll go extinct. But um, you know, just with our carbon dioxide, I, I'd like to just to say sorry, sorry, I'm to take up a little bit of your time here, John. Um, but I'd just like to say something about Peter. As I listened to Peter Wall's interview um, on Collapse Chronicles um, that you did just recently. 
And um, while I, I, I've got great admiration for Peter Waddogs, um, and um, we've interviewed him a good few times on Extinction Radio, Peter seems to want it two ways. Um, Peter um, is, is investigating uh, direct air capture of carbon um, mm. at the moment. Um, and these things are in a very early development stage, and Peter is basing all his hopes on this technology. Um, and uh, he, he says on the one hand, um, well, he assumes that this technology is going to be available in his um, projections uh, on, on, fu on the future, on whether we, we will go extinct or not. And you asked him that question. Um, he presumes that this technology is going to be available, a bit like some of the things that the IPCC assume are going to be um, happening. Now, um, uh, then he goes, on the other hand, to say that um, if it's not there, then um, in a few decades we will be extinct. And, and for me, um, Peter is living in a fantasy land here to think that uh, carbon capture technology can be scaled up um, and the um, Arctic uh, the geoengineering, as he mentioned as well, is, um, is safe in any way. Um, so um, I think you can't have it both ways. Um, and, uh, you know, I tend to go along with the, 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 um, the conclusion that um, the carbon uh, capture technology will, cannot be upscaled. Um, we need, uh, he agrees with Paul Beckwith, we need a whole change of lifestyle for everybody on the planet. We need to you know, uh, uh, um, put all our resources, um, which are the Earth's resources, all our money, which is basically equal to the Earth's resources, into this carbon capture technology. And it appears we need to have millions and millions of these things across the planet. It's just not going to happen. So um, while, while I've got great respect for Peter Waddams and I have great respect for Paul Beckwith as well, um, this is not going to happen. Therefore, I'll just go along with what people are saying within the, the next uh, three decades, I think he said, we will probably be going extinct. Okay, well, I definitely want, want to come back to this, but Jennifer, let's get back to you, and let's, uh, basically, I'm going to start you off the same way I did with Mike, just, uh, what, what is, do you agree with, is your vision of 2050 the same as, uh, as Mike's, or do you would differ a little bit? Well, I, I would say roughly we're, we're pretty much agreed and we're along the same lines. Let's take a look at this. So we're talking about 2050, that's 32 years from now. So that means 32 years more of mega emissions because I don't really see us stopping it. Plus the additional feedbacks that are coming into play and all of the permafrost that is gonna be degassing and the methane, would have already um, been in full flow. And as soon as, as we mentioned before, as soon as that Arctic sea ice melts, um, you know, basically any vestige of a jet stream is going to go away. So we can expect absolutely monolithic hurricanes. The temperature is gonna go up very fast. That's gonna to lead to sea level rise, accelerated sea level rise, accelerating and accelerating sea level rise. And, um, you know, it doesn't really take um, much to hit one of these nuclear reactors that are by the sea. I mean, I think we have, what, 450 nuclear reactors here on Earth for boiling water. Um, a hell of a way to boil water. Uh, you know, uh, you know, insanity of the human sort. Um, yeah, we seem to be a species that's, that's really set on our own destruction we seem if if we wanted to destroy ourselves i think we're going about it the absolute right way now will every single human be extinct by 2050 well you know i mean they have hollowed out whole mountains um that are full of food and supplies so maybe we'll become like strange little tribal <clears throat> mountain people living inside mountains, you know, something out of the planet of the apes or something. Um, I do know that civilization such as we know it today will not exist. Um, there's not going to be, 
any of the niceties, this whole civilization and the set of living arrangements that we've got today is going to go away. That Ooh. is the sad truth. That's yeah. Uh, on, on the way, on the way to human extinction, it's going to be a way station. Uh, so, what is that going to look like? Uh, it, I, I mean, do, do you actually? I, I'm I, I'm not going to be so rude as to ask you how. I, I know how old this woman is. And, and, and if I were to tell you guys, you would, you would call me a liar. Uh, there's no way you would believe uh, how old this beautiful, this beautiful young woman is in, in, in front of me. But, you, should, you should stop while you're ahead, Sam. You're doing so well. <laughs> but uh, do you actually think that this – now I'm – I'm uh, well. I'm getting ready to turn 59 in a couple of weeks, and it's just really the past couple of years I've started. You know, e even me, uh, I, I am saying, you know, that we could act. People who are getting ready to turn 59, people our age, can might actually see this in our lifetimes, not the lifetimes of our kids and grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Do you ever have? That that vision of this beautiful home behind you uh, might go away, and you might actually witness this. And how and how do you, if that's true, how do you handle that? <laughs> uh, that's a difficult one. And yeah, I mean, I fully believe that this whole civilization and all the beautiful nicety comforts and everything that we have is going to fall. And I don't know what it's going to look like. Of course, I'm scared to even think about it. I don't really know how to handle it, to be honest. I don't, I'm not really a prepper, per se, other than storing food. You got you know. daffodil bulbs in the backyard, to eat, or did the squirrels eat them all? <laughs> yeah, pretty much the squirrels got into them. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got squirrels to eat. You got that, that'll give you have a few squirrels to eat. So, so. Now, now, you do not have any kids, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Well, I have the luxury of being able to handle that psychologically because, you know, I got to say that um, the people who have kids, that is the hardest thing to deal with because there's no way around that, right? I mean, that's a biological thing. Your kid, you, you cannot get around that. You you know, I mean, that's that's who you are. You either have a kid or you don't have a kid. I don't have children just worked out that way. Um, was that a conscious decision on your part earlier in your life? Yeah, it was. Environment, was that an environmental decision or? <clears throat> no, not, not really. I didn't, I didn't not have children for the environment. Um, I'm probably not that selfless, but I just felt it wasn't my path. You know, I had the opportunity to have children a few times, but it, it wasn't something that I went with. You know, and are you ha are you happy? It turned out that way. Yeah, you know, for me, I mean, it's my life, and you know, obviously, I've I've adjusted uh, easily to not having children. Of course, having never had them, and uh, all that energy that I might be putting into raising children, and you know, it takes an awful lot of energy and money to raise yeah. children, and attention, and just like time you know well i have to do something with my life so i i you know have uh, information activism and and things like that 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 i you know do well you pick quite the hobby but i want to go back if, 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 let's go back to mike if i uh, like because i do want to because mike you do have children and grandchildren and if you don't want to get in this conversation say sam i don't even want to go there but if you're if you're willing to talk about it mike uh how how does it feel being a a father and a grandfather at the end of summer of 2018, knowing what you know? I mean, uh, how 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 do you deal with it, and what is your message uh, to to other people with the same beliefs as you do have children and grandchildren. Uh, just, just go down that road if you're willing to for a moment. Yeah, I'm willing to go down that <clears throat> excuse me, I'm I'm willing to go down that road, Sam. Um, having children is um, <laughs> people that don't have children will never understand what it's like to have children. 
they will never really contemplate what it's like. It's like some bizarre drug that you gotta you take and you try and expl explain the experiences that you have on that drug. You can never explain it unless someone actually takes it. Um, having children changed my life completely. Um, and you give up your own uh, personal freedom, if you like, for a collective freedom. And that collective freedom involves your children and it also involves your wife. And uh, I made a decision um, a long time ago that I wasn't going to have children, but my wife persuaded me to have one and we ended up having two. You know, accidents will happen. I think that's a, a famous song. Um, but anyway, we ended up having two. And the joy that this has brought me in my life and the love that I've been able to show and been shown by my children. My children have taught me the meaning of love. And to think that in these end times, the lives are going to be cut short um, and my new grandchild's life is going to be cut short is, is it's despairing, utterly and utterly despairing to think that, you know, my children are going to die and die in the near term, and so is my grandchild. Um, I'm, it, it's, it's hard for me to put into words, but I'm, I'm generally, if you look at the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross um, grief scenario thing, then um, I'm generally in acceptance, but that is the one thing which I just cannot accept. Um, and I, I find it very, very hard um, to accept. So, um, yeah, it's not good, Sam. I think I just called you the wrong name there. Um, uh, uh, Sam, uh, yeah, um, extremely difficult. Um, and I think you, if you have children, you have a different perspective on, on, on life in general. And you put your children before yourself. Um, and certainly that's what I do. Um, that's my biggest concern is my children and my grandchild. Now, do you actually at all? Do you, do you even go here with your with your own kids? Are they are they part of this conversation, or is this just not? Uh, my, my kids have seen me as a green activist all my life, you know. So it maybe wasn't quite as hard for them to make the adjustment that I'd gone a bit strange. Um, although they don't. Um, one, one of my children is actually a member of the near-term human extinction support group. Um, and she's just had my grandchild. Uh, my other child doesn't really know anything about it at all. Um, and it's, I, I really am not allowed to speak about it with them. One of them is kind of aware of it and I think follows it behind my back a bit. But the other one is just... She's kind of aware of it, but she doesn't want to go there. And it's exactly the same with my wife. She used to be chair of the Scottish Green Party, what, 15, 20 years ago. She knows that the shit is going to hit the fan, but I can't speak to any of my family about this. So, so, your, so your own family, I mean, are they even going to listen to this interview? No. You know, they, 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 yeah, let's well, say with mine there, there's absolutely nobody in my family who will ever watch one, one minute of collapse. They have no interest in, in the entire subject. So I'm no. assuming the near term human extinction group that this is a common thing you, you guys talk about on your Facebook page that people with, they were dealing with this in their own lives. Uh, it, it, it's kind of like a safe place to come on and talk about it. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the whole idea of the group. I, I set up five years ago at Hamburg when I realized that we were going extinct. Um, and uh, everybody on the page is compassionate, they're generous. Um, and it, most of them say that that is the only place that they can go. It's the only haven they've got where they can talk to like-minded people on a regular basis about this. And I'm really pleased that I set it up and it exists for people like you, me, or whoever to actually, they're actually able to speak to people, you know. But we do have a map and we encourage people to set up their own groups in their own areas so they can talk to each other about it. They can form relationships of whatever sort. Um, yeah, but I think it's vital until, you know, the internet goes down that people have somewhere that they can go, a refuge. And it's really a refuge for people. 
Yeah. I, I, I want to I want to come back and, and pick up this idea of the internet going down, but I want to I'm, I'm I'm trying to I have to be a little bit psychotic here, going back and forth between Scotland and Colorado, being in Connecticut. So Jennifer, if we can come back to you, and we're going to kind of switch gears here again, since I feel like I I I, I think that at least you're best known for your study and uh, uh, of the Arctic ice and, and, and the methane bomb and, and those general topics. So we're going to be hearing uh, probably when in the next week about the, the Arctic ice extent and whatnot. So just do a rip on what, I, what happened to the mythical blue ocean event. This, oh, it's it's uh, it's on its way. It just hasn't materialized uh, yet. Thank goodness. But you know, not on the way this year. Not on no, not for this oh, year. So we've got another reprieve. You know, every every September is the the low ice extent in the Arctic, and we always watch it. <clears throat> and that's the you know the time that the ice is lowest after the summer melt. You know, has gone through its cycle, and then it starts to build again after the yeah. middle of September or so. So, you know, we'll be watching it. But probably what's most interesting to look at is the volume. The extent is interesting and somewhat indicative, but it really doesn't tell the whole story because especially now, the Arctic Ocean is very striated with temperature and there's a lens uh, about 50 meters deep or so of um, fresh, cool water just under the ice. And that's um, more easily um, frozen because it's not salt water. But then, you know, with the cyclones that are going on in the Arctic, that's, that's getting mixed in again, too. So that's a temporary sort of situation. But what's most notable about the Arctic is that the um, volume is going down significantly. And it is just a matter of time. I mean, you just look at any of these graphs. I've, we've been showing them on Extinction Radio lately, doing slideshows <clears throat> with climate graphs. Very fun, <laughs> quite nerdy, but, you know, important information. And I, I happen to love graphs. I, I, my, my, one of my aims is uh, <laughs> make, make science sexy again or something like that. I mean, it's, science is very, very interesting, and we have a science deficit disorder here in the United States especially. So we are making making a great effort through information activism to share understanding about what's happening in the Arctic. But, you know, as soon as that, that Arctic sea ice goes away, honestly, and I mean, I know we just keep saying this again and again, but it's going to happen. It's going to happen in a few years. God knows exactly when. But, you know, after that, you know, you think that things have been changing and we've been having abrupt climate change events. Yes, we have. We've been having strong hurricanes. But I believe that after the Arctic sea ice goes, any semblance of a northern jet stream is going to go out, out completely. And the hurricanes and all sorts of abrupt climate change events, droughts, um, rainstorms, hail, all sorts of things like that, are going to be unleashing themselves with greater vengeance. And um, I think we're looking at a very different world in the future. Okay, so this is the question that, that I was uh, kind of, well, I won't say trying to back Peter Wadhams into a corner with. I mean, it, it was just the, just the open-ended question. So much of the attention, I'm gonna ask you the same question I asked Peter just, just two weeks ago. Uh, there's the when, and some people are so bogged down in the when, 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 nobody is, well, very few people are, are, are talking about the so what. I mean, obviously nobody knows until it happens, but what is, so what if uh, we have a blue ocean event, what does that mean for global industrial civilization. From the time we have a, the first blue ocean event, there's everything from the camp, which we don't talk about much on this channel, that humans will be extinct within six to 18 months of the first 
blue ocean event all the way to people saying, so what? What is you, with your studying, obviously you have studied this a lot more than I have. Uh, what, what, what are your tea leaves telling you about what's going to happen and how quickly when we do have the mythical blue ocean event? Well, I think that that really is a big tipping point, and I don't think that it's been overblown at all. And I do think that that's kind of the well before the Blue Ocean event and after the Blue Ocean event. Life before, life after. Life before, normal. Life after, Abby, normal. And I really think um, we're going to have a methane bomb, you know, and... Um, <clears throat> the reason is I've been looking at it as have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other people. And we already see in the Yamal Peninsula, you know, these methane blowholes coming up, right? We see that coming up out of the permafrost. And that just shows you when methane explodes, it comes out with great force. And if it can't find a way out, sometimes it explodes in a very dramatic fashion as it does up in the Yamal Peninsula with methane blowholes. But, you know, methane, it shouldn't be underestimated. It's not a very long-lived greenhouse gas, but it is really, really potent. And there's just so much of it. And the amount to double the atmospheric burden of methane, it's going to happen, you know. Um, <clears throat> so what does that mean to double the atmospheric load of methane? It means that we could have up to, and don't quote me on this amount, but it's going to get hotter. I mean, it could go up a, a degree or something like that. That doesn't sound like a lot. I'm talking centigrade. But, you know, if it goes up suddenly a degree centigrade, then, you know, I mean, it puts everything into disarray. And it's, it's actually going to encourage the rest of the methane in the permafrost in the um, East Siberian Sea to, to, to come out because it's either frozen or not frozen. And that's the tipping point right there. Right now it's like locked. Most of it is just still locked in these ice cages. You know, once those ice cages dissolve, you know, the whole thing is just going to outgas into the atmosphere. Very little is actually going to be absorbed into the Arctic Ocean itself because the water column up in the East Siberian Arctic Shelf is very, very shallow. So it's only got like 60 meters of water to go through. There won't be any ice, but the water itself, like the depth of the water there, the land is quite flat, and that's where all the methane deposits are. So, you know, once, once, once we have a blue ocean event, the Arctic Ocean is going to get warm and all the energy that is going into melting the ice right now it's going to go into melt to um, warming the Arctic Ocean. You know, the Arctic Ocean has been able to stay right around zero degrees centigrade because of its ice cover. But you know, when that ice cover goes away, it's just like when you have a drink of iced tea or something like that, right? It's it's going to happen. So it it just it doesn't look good it looks actually very very bleak indeed because once this methane just starts outgassing and outgassing from the permafrost and from the arctic ocean itself and other places in the world too but we're really looking at the arctic um there's more than enough heat going into the atmosphere to you know trigger some sort of other chain reactions that we haven't probably figured out yet but it's it's I, I know for sure it's going to cause much bigger and more lethal hurricanes so we've already seen what happens you know with with these hurricanes we've been having the last couple of years and even just look what happened to Japan the other day you know and it just got nicked it could have gotten you know hit much worse by that typhoon that, that hit it the other day but you know we're not looking at a at a good at a good future and I don't expect it to be acknowledged by the press at large. Um, I think it's too big of a thing to acknowledge. I don't think they would be allowed to really acknowledge that, you know, we're on a path to extinction. It, it's not allowed in the... In the oh, are, are you... Now, I, I know a lot of people are talking about the, the effects on the global food supply that with this sudden burst of heat, 
Yeah. That, uh, I mean, in one summer, I mean, do you, are, are you of that school of thought that it will, that it will be the, uh, just our ability to feed itself is going to feed ourselves is going to be one of the, the big, uh, knock on effects of the blue ocean event. Are you? Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've been seeing that for years. I think food insecurity is one of the biggest issues that we're going to face. And as soon as we have a couple of good famines, you can believe the fear is going to set in. And, you know, at some point, the realization is going to dawn on the masses, on the public at large, that we are on a bad trajectory and it's not going to get any better. And at some point, I believe that the reality of our situation is going to set in. Right now, it's still hidden, but I don't think for, you know, really that much longer. But, you know, it doesn't take much to get crops to fail. Already, this year in the Soviet Union, the, the wheat crop was really, really... Um, scaled back um, due to uh, drought and of course look what drought can do look what happened in Syria right they had a couple of good years of drought and all of a sudden they've got like the Syrian conflict which has been an absolute humanitarian disaster so food leads to political strife leads to war leads to madness so you know some people say, well, we better <clears throat> scurry back from the cliff. Well, I disagree with that. I think we are off the cliff, and I don't think that we can easily scramble back to safety at this point. This is too big. It is got a lot of energy behind it. It's already well underway. And... You know, at this point, we are witnesses to the greatest catastrophe to, and the greatest extinction also, by the way, to ever befall this earth. This, this sixth extinction that we're currently starting, engaged in right now, is going to make the Permian mass extinction pale in comparison because we are emitting vast amounts of carbon stores so much faster than ever happened in the Permian mass extinction. This thing has quite a kick. And um, the thing about climate, it's from our human perspective, it's a slow mover. But in fact, this thing is happening from lightning speed from a geologic standpoint. Yes, it is. Well, Mike, let's, let's go back to you. I want to uh, pick up on a, on a comment that you kind of close your last section with about when, when the internet goes down. I, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of getting us out of climate change here. I, I, I have made the point before that to, when people ask me, how are we going to know that the end is nigh? I'm saying when the internet goes down and you, and you understand it's not coming back, that within 72 hours of the internet going down, that that is going to be the trigger that, that sets off Mad Max. Uh, I'm, I'm being a little bit hyperbolic when I say that. But, but take a rip on that. What, what do you feel like is going to be the trigger? When are people going to know? Uh, that this is no more, that this is no joke, this is no hoax. And, and that, they, you know, it's time to hunker down. Um, I think you make a good point, Sam. Um, when the internet goes down, you know, you'd say 72 hours. Well, I think we're, we're all fairly aware that, you know, food's only, food is only available on supermarket shelves usually for about three days. That, that's uh, why I made and, the connection, yeah. Sorry? That's why I make the connection, that very reason. So Yeah, so um, as, as soon as the food starts uh, to run out, then we're, we're, we're going to see chaos um, starting to erupt all over the world in, in various forms, depending on what part of the world you live in. And I mean, in, in America, there's a hell of a lot of guns. There's a huge gun culture. Um, so a lot of people will be getting shot. Um, in other parts of the world where, isn't, where there isn't a gun culture, 
uh, we'll find things are probably a lot nastier because uh, we won't go out as quickly as a gunshot wound. Uh, it'll be knives and dogs and gangs and things, um, which um, make life rather nasty for, for us. But obviously, you know, um, your Collapse Chronicles is going to collapse. Um, the near-term human extension support group will collapse. Will be not, and, and we've been talking about this as admins on the group recently, about how important it is for people to be prepared for the internet actually going down. Um, because when it goes down, there's going to be no refuge of any support groups on the internet anymore. And there's going to be nothing. And it's not just that it's going down, it's that we're also addicted to it as being part of our lives endlessly. You see the endless mobile phone addiction. Everybody has their phones in their hands. Everybody's on Facebook all the time. I am uh, as well, you know. Um, so, but I, I, I'd, I'd like if, if you don't mind just to go back to a couple of earlier points I didn't get a chance to comment on. Um, we, we get... We get Peter Waddams um, and Sam Karana. Let's take a couple of extremes here. Um, you know, we've, we've, um, we've got, um, and, and we've also got other commentators um, who, who are going on about the blue ocean event. Um, some of them are being alarmist, um, very alarmist. And uh, uh, this kind of alarmism um, can affect people very badly. The, you know, they have to plan their, their lives around uh, this alarmism, although they don't see it as alarmism. But there have been blue ocean events predicted. It was one of Peter Wadham's uh, biggest mistakes to predict a blue ocean event. And there are other commentators as well um, who have predicted them last year, or predicted them this year, they predicted the collapse of civilization. It's already meant to be happening in a different way to what I was saying. I mean, a major collapse of the whole of civilization. Um, and we, we have the, the opposite of um, Peter Warren saying that we are at 0.9 degrees Celsius at the moment above um, the pre-industrial um, average, uh, pre-industrial norm, whatever, pre-industrial times. And uh, you know, Sam Carana saying we're at 1.7. Um, now, there's a big gap in, 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 those, um, in those conclusions um, about um, where we are today. And I'd just like to bring up Corey Morningstar's article as well. Um, I, if people want to look it up, I can't at this moment remember where, where it is, but I'll maybe get in touch with you to send you a link. But how these uh, 1 degree, 1.5, 2 degree, um, centigrade measures were arrived at, they were actually arrived at by economists. They weren't arrived at by environmentalists or climate change scientists, they were arrived at by economists, so things like the Paris Climate uh, Agreement um, and, and, you know, the IPCC predictions are all, all based on false premise, premises. Um, in, in that they conclude that this will happen by then when it's 1.5 degrees, but it's 2 degrees centigrade. I think, um, you know, Peter Warren is called the near term human extinction movement, he called it. And I don't see us moving anywhere for the time being, but he's called it the, the movement um, as being very alarmist uh, or extremely alarmist because he was called alarmist in The Guardian recently. Um, uh, <laughs> you know, um, I find it just, um, just to get onto the promotion of that, is that if there's a 50 gigaton dirt of methane in, in the Arctic, then uh, Peter Warren says it's going to be three to five years before that really kicks in and we feel the effects of it. Well, whether that be right or not, I, I don't know. But, you know, I, I just get the feeling that Peter Warren is not looking out the window. And he's not looking at the extreme, all the records that have been broken all over the world this year in terms of flooding, in terms of heat records, in terms of um, crop failures, in terms of, you know, Peter is concentrated on um, uh, carbon capture machines and promoting his book, Fair About to Ice. Well, fair enough, you know. Uh, but, you know, for me, a lot more of our concentration should be in supporting each other in these end times. Um, and, you know, to call the near-term human extinction movement more alarmist than he is, well, as I said before, he can't have it both ways. And, you know, what about Sam Corona? 
What about Sam Prana? You know, a lot of people take their information from Sam Prana, and they have presentations, and it's all Sam Prana's information that they use. Now, you know, um, you know, how come he says it's 1.75 degrees, and Peter Warren says it's 1.9 degrees? Well, what is it? Zero, zero point nine, but I, I, I don't yeah, think yeah, zero that Peter's going as far back. I, I would have to re-listen to the interview I just have with him. I didn't want to get into a debate with the man. He, you know, these 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 interviews are not are, are, are not debates. There's there, if, if anyone wants to hear my opinion, there's other places on the internet to to, to hear me blather on, me bloviate about about my opinions. The purpose of this channel is to is to get other voices, and which is exactly yeah, for sure. And I see we good good lord. I thought I thought we had been talking about twenty minutes. It, we are. We are 51 minutes into this, so, <laughs> so Mike, I'm going to uh, to to finish up with you now, and the way I finish up with everyone, and then we're going to come back and finish up with Jennifer. So my my parting question to you, as it is to every one of my guests, and so you get an extra you get an extra 60 seconds to think of your answer to this question, Jennifer. <laughs> And that is, you're you're not talking to Sam Mitchell from Collapse Chronicles. You're 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 actually talking to the mainstream media, and you have a 60 second soundbite to give the Mike Farragut message to the planet here in the waning days of the summer of 2018. What would that 60 second sound like? Starting now. Starting now. Well, it might be very silent, Sam. Because um, I don't know if I would want to give a message to the mainstream media because ignorance is going to have to be bliss for most of the people on this planet. Um, and it, without support, I wouldn't give a, the message out of near-term human extinction on the mainstream media. Um, that's all I want to say. Okay. Well, that that is that that is fair enough, but but. Mike Farragut, I want to uh, want, once again thank you very much for your your hard, thankless work down here in the Dumasphere. There, there's a few of us out here who really appreciate it, brother. Uh, and, and to the best of our ability, we we've got your back. From uh, you know, all we've got, all we've got is each other from here on out, and we appreciate you being one of the soldiers in the trenches and. I hope we get a chance, as I'm sure we will, to talk again in the future. So I'm going. Well, well, thank you. Thanks for having me on, Hamburn. And I think <clears throat> me and that guy Hamburn is you just mentioned. You've done that twice now. You've got. Yeah, sorry, to sorry. Uh, I was, I was somebody. Other people have made that. I got to find out who the hell you guys are talking about because I have. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for having me on, Sam. Um, and I think um, me and Jennifer will get our own back by inviting you on Extinction Radio and finding all about uh, what Sam thinks about these things and give you 60 seconds to sum it up at the end. Uh, uh, okay, I'll be glad to do that. But right now, we're going to say goodbye to Mike, and we're going to head back to Boulder, Colorado for the last five minutes uh, uh, of, the, of this video. So, uh, Jennifer, back to you. So I guess I'm actually – going to give you five minutes if you if you want it let's just that's five minutes no no okay I, okay I, i'll give you four minutes jennifer if there's anything, <laughs> so I've got an extra four minutes to come. <laughs> four minutes jennifer if there's anything that i just haven't talked about that you've been biting your tongue going when is this idiot going to ask me about it go ahead and talk about that now and then uh when you finish with that give us your 60 second recap hmm. Well, I guess the main thing I want to say is, you know, it's good for us, those of us who have woken up to the climate crisis, to kind of keep things in perspective. I mean, there's a, there's not much we can do about this thing, right? It's going to happen. It's going to happen. But um, I think that we are witnesses, right? We're witnesses to a unique period in history. It hasn't happened before. 
and it's probably not going to happen again. So, <laughs> this is a once in a lifetime. So I mean, it's kind of a unique time to be alive. So I mean, you know, there's there's of course the panic side, right? You know, oh God, what are we going to do? You know, we're mortal. We're going to die. Well, we were going to die anyway. It just might be more unpleasant, but. I think it's good for us to appreciate the uniqueness of the time. It's a horrible time, really. It's a horrible time to be living. I mean, we're living in the time of we're just like that train that's come left off the tracks. <clears throat> and it's kind of, you know, mid-flight. And if we have the wherewithal to wake up, during mid-flight and see what's going on might be an interesting ride down. I think ultimately we are going on a ride down. Yeah, there's no way. It's got too much force behind it. But, you know, during this ride down, maybe we can love a little bit more, be a little bit more conscious, be a little bit more compassionate. You know, this is a time for compassion. There's a lot of need for compassion right now. People are going to be needing a lot of support. Maybe you don't need support today, but maybe this person over here does, you know. So this is, this is a time to, to witness it, to come together, to speak truth. Um, if you're interested in that, and if you're not interested in that, yahoo, you know, don't wake up. And I think that's probably, you know, if you haven't woken up yet, then there's still time to just like turn around and, you know, go do something completely mindless and forget about all of this. But, you know, for those of us that have woken up, <clears throat> this is a time of reflection. It's a time of recapitulation. It's a time of awareness. It's a time of anger. I have to say it's a time of mourning and anger. It's, it's many, many different things. But most of all, it's a time for being awake. So that's kind of what I have to say about it. All right. I, I, will, I will let you, uh, I, I, I won't pin you down to 60 seconds summation of that because we are 57 minutes into it and my camera is giving me the shut this down or we will for you. Anyway, Jennifer Hines and Mike Farragan, one more time, extinctionradio.net the near-term human extinction support group on Facebook. And we have a YouTube channel. We need to get the uh, subscriber base of their YouTube channel uh, on. So I, I hope you're going to you're absolutely feel free to broadcast this after after next Tuesday. Uh, this, this interview will show up on Collapse Chronicles and probably – at least one other place on the uh, internet somewhere next Tuesday. So after next Tuesday, feel free. But once again, Jennifer and Mike, both of you, from the bottom of my Sam Mitchell collapse chronicle heart, I want to say uh, just, just, just thank you for your your hard, thankless task, and we do appreciate it. So stick around after we finish, but uh, I'm going to say goodbye, and so say goodbye to the Bye to the tribe, and then we'll come back and chat here in a minute. All right. Bye, tribe. Be cool. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Sam. Thanks for having us on. Thanks for coming up with the idea of having us on. I hope we haven't been too miserable and too gloomy. I think Jennifer put a bit of positivity there, which is great at the end. And, um, yeah, um, thanks, everybody, for listening uh, to uh, Collapse Chronicles. And look out for... And Sam, who will be on Extinction Radio soon. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye, Bye, everyone. <laughs>